I guess we'll just pass on the microphone, give everybody a chance to make an opening statement. I guess you had a very interesting presentation and very thought provoking, so I guess we'll get some responses to that. I, st I start with Kai. Okay, so my name is Kai Rannenberg. I'm a professor in business informatics at Goethe University in Frankfurt. And what makes the name complex is actually that this professorship is partially an endowment from Deutsche Telekom and is focused on mobile business and multilateral security. So from that point of view, there should be a relation to this. I suppose I was invited to this panel for two reasons. Uh, one reason is to advertise the panel in the afternoon. So please come back after lunch, because in the afternoon we're going to talk about certification systems and certification agreements and to make all of this work. And from that point of view, then it's probably important that we focus on what do we actually want to certify. So and that was the advertising bit. And the other bit is now what can free software does for us. I think and Richard has nicely explained that and free software comes with a number of quality assurances, even though and even though Richard has said he's happy about quality, but quality is not as important as freedom. Still the and as it was explained, obviously certain quality assurances are important and for what we want to do, especially because of these very complex trust relationships. And but this is not only about statements and people trying to make things free. It's also about organizing a process around that and that people can check on all of that. And obviously that is cost, costs money. And from that point of view, we have to find an infrastructure and an organization that does this not only as an amateur exhibition and idea of people who love to do the work and who probably do it very often very well, but it also needs to happen when all of the very good people who are amateurs and love to do this very well have to raise their children or look after and getting money for, for, for buying bread for their children or all the other things that some people need to do in life. I'm Michael Homut from CanConcept, based in Dresden, Germany, a small company uh, supporting the free software microkernel operating system. It's actually an operating system, not just a kernel. <laughs> the L4 re operating system. And uh, I'd like to directly tackle the questions that were given to us um, as the panel questions. And th I'd start with the second one. Why is there no end user device available today that does not contain at least some critical software or firmware component that does not nearly sufficiently, that are not nearly sufficiently verified relative to complexity or are non verifiable <coughs> in its source code without NDA or proprietary? Well, um, first, I'd like to start with a technical statement. We don't have any such um, end-user device today because it's technically impossible because of the system architectures today to create a system that, is, that has vi verifiable software and firmware components because the complexity of the systems is just too high. You can't verify it. It's a matter of a system architecture. The systems are huge. Um, the complexity is not understood and is not, it can be approached with, with, with mathematical or formal methods known today uh, as long as they stay as complex as they are. And then uh, the second part of the question is about why there's no, why we can't really verify it and it's not available in source code. And I'll come back to that as part of the third question. Um, this, then the other question was why is there no end user computing device available at any cost, which would give the user meaningful confidence that its computing is not completely compromised undetec undetectably. Well, the, the, there else, again, the problem is the complexity and what is the solution? Of course, we have to reduce the complexity. And that's actually something that we try to do with our operating system, where we try to confine all the regular uh, software that you use, but you did that you cannot trust anymore, uh, is confined into its own little um, uh, compartment. And um, by that, if you choose the right system architecture, you can establish very small trusted computing bases um, that are actually, that actually lend themselves to formal verification and to other methods of establishing trust. And um, with that, it's possible to remain, um, to, to keep available all the software that you use today and that you love to use, but it will be possible, it would be possible for you to not trust that software any longer with regard to any um, uh, trust that you need to have. For example, that it doesn't leak your secret keys or that it doesn't leak your private information and so on. And then the thir third part was what could 
what should the free software community uh, prioritize, short term and long term, in the post Snowden world? And there, I'm actually at a bit of a loss because um, I, I think the main problem there is motivation. I don't know what motivates people today to contribute to free software. I know what motivated me to actually free the operating system that we are working on. Um, I was probably highly influenced by Richard by at that time. <laughs> and uh, uh, I, my main private motivation was that I'm a tinkerer and I wanted to be in control of the systems that I use. I didn't, I wanted to be the master of the system. And um, also I was working in an environment that allowed me to, um, to free the software and to make it available, which was an academic environment. I don't know how people could be motivated to, uh, uh, to do that today. Most people who contribute to free software today don't do that because they want to contribute to free software, but, but because it's the most economical thing to do because you, can, you have access to um, interesting systems like the Linux kernel, like the GNU operating system that you can use as a base for your own application. And it's the most cost effective way to do that. And that's why most contributors to free software nowadays come from big companies who do it purely for economic reasons. I have no idea what the free software community can do about that. Thank you. Okay, Thanks. okay uh, Jan Rupp from uh, GSMK. Um, First of all, I'd like to thank uh, my two predecessors for uh, setting the ground. Um, I can only build on that and um, summarize, okay, we have an issue with moving from quote unquote amateur stage to professional stage. Um, when we need an organization to support that, how do we do that? And then there is the security issue of reducing complexity, et cetera, et cetera. Assuming you can solve the technology problem, um, assuming you can solve the organizational problem, there remains one problem, and um, at this point in time, maybe it shows that one of my sins in my academic life was getting a PhD in economics. And um, th there you have the concept of uh, public goods and uh, social benefits. And uh, in this case, the question is, if we have um, a social benefit of free software, um, why is not everything uh, free software today? I know there are, of course, many reasons for that, but... Um, one of the many reasons is uh, very often you have uh, um, an allocation problem to solve. So um, there is a public benefit, but um, the benefactors and uh, the producers of technology are somewhat disassociated. So uh, what is the best way uh, to do something about that? And um, how can we achieve things like critical mass um, when uh, we don't have the funds available? And uh, I believe strongly believe that there is a role for public policy here, um, both on a European level as well as on a national level. Um, why don't we have more funding for elementary stuff like 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 email encryption and so on? Um, wh why is that not the case? And uh, I think with some uh, reasonable and uh, moderate measures, both on a political uh, level as well as on a funding level, we can achieve a lot more and uh, that would make all of us better off. <coughs> okay, um, in regards to this issue, uh, my uh, view is that uh, free software is completely essential for achieving uh, meaningful levels of IT assurance, but, but not for the reasons that are commonly assumed. Uh, now, theoretically, a proprietary system which can be verified in its source code, in all its components, without an NDA, that has uh, a lot of resources to do auditing by very professional people, very well paid, and so on, could achieve uh, higher, much higher levels of trustworthiness than a s complete system which has only free software, which is made of 50 million lines of code, uh, no, all of them critical, and so on. That's theoretically. But if we're going at the, lev at the level we're aiming at, highest uh, assurance, not high assurance, then uh, not only we need to deal with the problem of complexity, so we need to reduce complexity uh, totally, but we also need to have uh, <coughs> a, a in, a in um, the auditing of the systems need not only be intensive, but need to be ethically, uh, you know, um, need to be uh, need to have a community and well intentioned. I'll, I'll explain myself. If I have a hundred million euros to verify this my high assurance system that I'm putting to market, I could pay. Not very uh, ex great experts in the world 
But what prevents these experts to get the equivalent amount of money from another government to spend their time no, hiding very well hidden mistakes uh, or backdoors in the system. So I, I, in order to have these huge levels of auditing relative to complexity that we need to aim, we need to have the involvement of very ethically inclined, you know, well-intentioned and uh, uh, high experts in there. So no, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a moderate amount, the, the IT experts in uh, free software community, they can actually contribute to this level. Because most, most people now, they work on softwares where security is not a major issue. But there are a whole host of uh, very uh, you know, high assurance experts in the community. And so um, free software not only gives you the, the four freedoms, one of which, of course, is being able to uh, verify the code that you're reading, but actually creates this uh, community and attraction, which is essential. Basically, if you don't have a very active involvement of worldwide, of the free software community, possibly focused on very few platforms w to avoid fragmentation, then you cannot beat hundreds of millions of euros which are spent on the other side to break it somewhere. So I think this is uh, an essential issue for the free software. And in the free software movement, I think that uh, uh, it should recognize some of the things I said. and. Uh, uh, because many in the, in the free software you know, privacy tools, uh, they assume that sti they still assume, even post Snowden, that the fact that it's uh, reviewable or its, uh, the, its source is accessible, that means it's verified enough, and uh, and it's automatically it's free of bugs. And so that misconceptions need to be uh, tackled head on because there's too much resources of community and private companies in the free software high assurance which are devoted to uh, systems which are way too complex to ever achieve anything. And so there's a misallocation of resources. And I think this is something that the free software community should uh, uh, tackle and, and, and look towards. Richard? Um, it's certainly possible for a non-free program to have some kind of practical advantage over some free program. Uh, most people are thinking more about convenience. A non -fr certain non-free program may be more convenient than a certain free program that it competes with. This often happens. And I've never tried to convince people that those advantages don't exist. After all, they can judge that for themselves. What I tell people is, if you don't have freedom, you're going to be shafted. Freedom in the long term is more important than convenience in the short term. And in the long term, proprietary software won't have any advantages if we insist on free software. The only thing that enables proprietary developers to make some kind <coughs> of practical advantage is that lots of people are accepting the loss of freedom that their products impose. If we learn to reject those proprietary programs, to say, this is an attack on me, I won't take it, then by and by, they won't be able to do better practically either. And of course, that can apply to any kind of practical advantage, uh, high reliability, high assurance, that's a practical advantage. If we want freedom, we've got to insist on so that society directs its efforts to build practical advantage in places and ways that respect our freedom also. But it's also true that it's very hard to establish, to, to, to put security in something which we don't have control over at all. Can I just reply no, briefly? Um, I think in this issue of uh, free, the freedom, uh, uh, having trustworthiness, meaningful trustworthiness uh, on, on a system as a pragmatic advantage. I think that this calls in question a definition of freedom in computing that we have, is that to some you know, uh, ordinary citizens, the freedom from having that computer being completely surveilled and doing completely different things than what uh, the program looks like it's doing, even if I'm looking at the source code, may be 
as valuable as the other freedoms that we have there. So it's not at all, and I, I, don't, I don't think it, it, it's, it's a practical advantage. It's an essential civil freedom advantage, and possibly, and here we, may, we probably surely disagree with Richard, it's a freedom which is more important than the other four, and actually it's a precondition for, uh, I will just finish in 20 seconds and I'll give it back to you. It's a precondition from the others, because if that, so that software that uh, I'm passing around and I'm distributing, it's full of bugs of NSA and people spying, I'm spreading a virus. I'm spreading something which is enabling you know, people to lose their core civil rights and so on. So it's a precondition. What I'm saying is that one is a precondition of the other. It's not a, no, a trustworthiness is not a practical advantage. It's a precondition. It's a fifth freedom that we need. Your, your spreading FUD about an imaginary problem because, in fact, the programs that spy on people all the time are proprietary ones. You've got to expect every proprietary program to be designed to spy, and you can't check if it is, and there's nothing you can do about it. Uh, when we take control of programs, then we have the possibility to insist that they not spy on us, to say, which, which in practice means, of course, just as as Bruce Schneier showed us how these systems work, you'll lose your reputation if we see that you made it spy on us. That doesn't work with the proprietary software developers. They have no shame. They make programs spy on users and the users know it and they just arrogantly think they don't dare reject us. But in the free world, it's easy to reject anybody, any particular developer it's easy to say, we don't trust him, we don't want him changing our code, and it's easy to lose your reputation, and it matters if you, if you do. In the proprietary world, it doesn't matter. We don't have reputation helping us anymore. So in practice, if you don't want the program to spy, the first step is it's got to be free software. So I, I agree to this. Maybe other people want to respond, but at least if you look at yeah, look at NSA level opponents, they actually don't care about their reputation. The NSA has put a backdoor standard into NIST, and NIST published this, and ANSI did, and ISO did. So in fact, Richard assumes that people care about their reputation, but some actually prefer to undermine systems rather than have their reputation. So I guess the question is, don't we need better governance? Even if software is free, some people may be willing to put in backdoors. Wait, wait, wait. The point is. Okay, I get some debate there. Okay, Rich Johnson and then Kai. It's a, it's a reasonable point. It's a real point, but there's a misunderstanding there. The NSA doesn't care about its reputation as such, but if, but if we see a contributor to a, to free software is untrustworthy, we don't have to depend on that contributor to feel ashamed. We can say we don't trust you, and we won't take anything from you. So, yes, in the proprietary world, we'd have to depend on the NSA's own sense of shame and conscience, which, is, which are not going to help us. But in the free world, we're not dependent on that. We can judge what to do based on our idea of someone's trustworthiness. We can protect ourselves even in a world where not everybody is trustworthy. Thanks for pointing that out. And just to have one question, um, isn't the free software world permanently underfunded? And do I really have that choice? Like for instance, when I look at, again, essential stuff, like let's take GNU PG. Um, the GNU PG core is maintained by less than a handful of people. So assuming I don't like, like their coding style and I have reason for not li liking certain elements of the coding style. So what is my alternative? Where do I go to? You can, of course, say, program it on your own. Um, but don't we have a very, very thin layer of options there? And uh, that's, that's why I wonder, don't we need a more robust foundation to be able to actually enrich that choice and then have more options? We have plenty of choices. You've just made an artificial choice, which is limited in order to appear to prove a certain point. 
But actually, the all, you have plenty of options besides starting over again and doing it differently. You can study their code and you can change their code and you can publish another version. You can raise funds to do this. You can then recruit helpers. If you can do a better job with a fork of GPG than the GPG developers are doing, you're free to do it because it's free software. And th this sort of thing has happened with other free programs. I don't think it's happened with GPG. I guess people are reasonably satisfied with what they're doing. Now we can rate, it's true we don't have enough money, but of course the fact that a project has lots of money doesn't mean it's going to be honest. There's a lot of money for the development of Windows. There's a lot of money for the development of Apple's malware systems, and yet they mistreat us. I'm sure Amazon has plenty of money for developing the swindle. You can't, you, you know, it's silly to imagine that another project is going to treat us better just because there's more money being put into it if all else is not equal. That's the crucial point. If all else were equal, yes, it would be better if we had more funds. But you know when you're comparing free software with proprietary that all else is not equal. Uh, there is an increase in funds going into assurance of free software because a few, uh, a few scandalous bugs were discovered. Of course, it's still not worse than proprietary software, but still it's a, a real problem. And this motivated some to contribute funds to better maintenance of some free software packages. Well, that's a step forward. We can do more of that. If we're concerned about this, we can, we can c try to convince those with money to put some into this. Um, I'd like to address one point that you made, and that was that we would like to increase our trust in free software. And I'd like to spin this in a little bit differently, and I'd, I'd like to propose that we instead build our system such that we have to trust software less. And um, that would allow us to not spend so much funds on building up trust in huge code bases, in certification, um, in applying expensive methods for establishing trust, or even, very popular in the US, um, into mitigation measures that try to limit the damage once the system has been compromised. Um, if we would build our system such that we have to trust less, trust it less, that we have to trust a few, a smaller part of a, of a trusted operating system, a trusted firmware, for example, then our resources would be better spent and our uh, trust would ultimately go up. We as the computer community. <laughs> Well, that's maybe an important point here. Who is, who is actually um, we then, and how to make maybe the we a bit less complex? And that would be actually my point if I come back to the original question. What is what I see as a role of the free software movement here? And I think the role of the free software movement here could be to tackle some of the fundamental issues that we simply have with com computer science and with software development. Software is notoriously error prone. Software is notoriously faulty, even the best willing people and have, have errors in their software and have faults in their software and it's extremely hard to, to get them out and it takes takes long time. Uh, so this we need to overcome and I thought from, the, and, and we, we also know that the more complex we make the requirements to software, uh, the more complex the software gets and we multiply all of the problems that I've just mentioned. So what I would like to see from the free software movement is maybe to come up with a simple definition of what do we need, what was it meaningful user control and basically in the world that we're talking about here, probably it should be meaningful user control about the communication that they have with other people. And try to, let's say, define and then build an, that we can at least achieve to some, with some level of security um, that actually when I want to communicate with another person, and of course not only by email, that's relatively easy, we have, GG, and we have GPG for that, but maybe with voice communication because that's what most people are, are needing at the moment, that we can have that channel being built. And I would have thought that is a task that is complex enough for the next 15 years probably, and tackled with more or less money. And so I was wondering, can we, will, will the free software movement, or somebody will make a specification and start an initiative and say we're going to have something like that? 
I think there are already projects aiming to do that. W we, meaning the Free Software Foundation, we don't have funds to do that. In the most of what we do is done by volunteers who show up and want to do this or that. So all we can do is try to guide them. And we have another competing demand that users want even more, which is they want more functionality. Now, I'm completely in favor of the idea of designing systems so that the core we need to trust is smaller. But we can't reduce the total amount of code that might mistreat us conceivably because users want to do all those things. There's a reason why there are tens of thousands of free applications in Debian, GNU slash Linux is because every one of them is worth packaging and making available to other users because it does a job. You've got to compare this not, say, with Microsoft Windows, but with Microsoft Windows plus tens of thousands of applications that lots of users like. So, and now you look at the fact that with various kinds of phishing techniques, uh, users can be tricked using various kinds of programs into breaking the security of the system through lots of different kinds of programs they might be using. Uh, and you see that it's hard to just have some trusted core of the system which is enough security. It's enough for some, in some scenarios and to prevent some kinds of bad things. And so there's some validity in what you're saying. If we could make that core smaller, we'd have safer systems. But we can't reduce the total size without throwing away lots of applications people want, and in the future they're going to be even more. So we can urge people and try to find the people, find people who will find funding to do a few specific secure communication things. I'm not the person who knows most of that, uh, about that. Jacob Applebaum would know a lot more, and he's the one you should talk with. Um, it's true, we can't really reduce the amount of software that we use and that we have to trust. But we can trust each individual piece of software somewhat less. So for example, on my laptop I have to trust my email program um, not to send out my crit critical business data via email. If I had a better compartmentalized system, I wouldn't have to trust it that way. Then would just be able to access my email and not my critical business data. research is done. It's just a matter of oh. how costly it is to implement that. Oh, well, are we going to be talking about something different? Because, uh, well, well, I of course, I don't know your project, and maybe you've done more than I'm guessing. That would be great. I'd like to find out. Uh, in addition to having a, a, a secure kernel at the base of things, you've got to figure out how to subdivide all your files and in practice how to say, Right now, I want to be able to work on just these files and not those. Now, there are systems that have tried to provide features you could do this with, but making them really usable and convenient and setting it up for the applications to work with them is another problem. But Michael is right. The basic research has been done. And, and now we're down to the practical things of, OK, very practical things like um, battery lifetime, standby times when, when you run full virtualization and, and these things. So uh, the good news is uh, on a technological level, I guess there are solutions around. I, I, I'm still worried about this um, dissociation between the public benefit of uh, free software and uh, the funding that goes to those who actually build the stuff. Um, if I may intervene, I think um, there may be a solution that brings uh, together the issues, the, the points raised. He's raising the point that you know, we need to minimize radically in order to have sufficient levels of auditing you know, that is satisfactory. Uh, Bjorn is saying that you know, uh, the free software, co free software community in high assurance is uh, structurally underfunded. You know, the business models sometimes work, they don't work. And overall, of after 20 years, we've seen it. It, you know, it, it's so hard to have a business model that can attract enough funds. 
Then uh, Richard says a pragmatic necessity is that people need a bunch of functionality. You know, or they want, you know, they want badly a bunch of functionality. So one way to, to do this could be to focus on a very small uh, computing architecture, which doesn't aim to do everything that you need. It, cu it could just do the most crucial things for your civil rights. And contemporarily, you're gonna, you have uh, another, another GNU Linux machines with free software that has all the bells and whistles with 10 million lines of code and people, so on. The question is, do people want this, right? Do they want two devices, one for the important things and one for the not so important? People don't want it. People want everything on one device. Exactly. Uh, this, um, this can be uh, tackled by us usability and portability of it. Nowadays, you have sm uh, smartphones which are four and a half millimeter thin, which are thinner than what is ergonomically. There's been a few studies that six, seven millimeters are better. So, and you have computing devices like display cards, bank cards, which are 0 0.7 millimeters and they have touch screen and so on. So you can very well imagine to have devices which are complementary. So instead of having a dual OS device, you know, this virtualization, uh, supposedly secure devices which have dual OS, you can actually have two different devices that you can even carry with you all the time without having two devices, which can even be sandwiched together inside the same case. You know, it could be just uh, eight millimeter thick and so on. So instead of having two phones, you can have, can have that. So you could start with that, and this uh, initial minimal uh, computing architecture can even support uh, more uh, less verified applications. Because if you have a trusted com uh, trustworthy computing base of this sort, not trusted, trustworthy, which is different, then you can have a virtualization layer that you can really trust, something you don't have now. So you can have two operating systems, or maybe even more than that, one only for certifiedly secure application, another one for application which are not certified, which can respond for pragmatic needs uh, of the users. And this platform can start small and then pick up in an actionable path and take over Apple and Google within a few years. Good responses. First well, moment. in principle, you can do that, but you may have to keep the data completely separate between the two if you, because any data that the less secure system could be used to fish for uh, isn't so secure, right? So that's why I'm saying that there are, there are difficulties at higher levels in this. By the way, I want to mention to people that outside of the table, there are GNU and FSF stickers that you can take. And also, uh, Alice and Bastien have some FSF buttons that they are selling, uh, not for a lot of money like the GNU, but for small amounts. And that way, you can support the Free Software Foundation. Just, could you raise your hands? Good. Okay, Michael wants to answer. I just wanted to point out that um, what you are describing is a stopgap stop gap measure. People who have critical data to protect carry two phones nowadays because they have to use one to um, send their girlfriends an email and to do Facebook stuff. And then they have, they have the other one that has the critical business data or the critical government data. And um, you are describing something that keeps one of them really small and trusted and also has the trusted hardware uh, done right. And, but ultimately what users want is just one device that can be trusted and that can do all of the stuff and it, the technology to separate the two different operating systems or two different compartments is all there. What's missing is the trusted hardware part and some of the uh, um, convenience things that Richard has been pointing out that might be missing there. Um, to, to, to bring it up here, I think this strategy has been uh, pursued by a few crypto phones in the last few years in which they used commercial uh, no, um, uh, uh, smartphones with all the complexities at the hardware and firmware layers and they put a very small hypervisor and so on and they have a huge uh, Android on one side and then they have a smaller thing there. Problem is that below that it's way too complex to have any trustworthiness and that's, that's why many of these initiatives actually failed because I think uh, they, they couldn't really deliver on the trustworthiness because they were not able to uh, minimize the hardware layer and so on. No, I, I mean, I, I shouldn't even go in the complexity of a typical Intel processor nowadays. 
people, uh, you're not even allowed to know how many processors are inside there, how many I pieces. So I, would, I would disagree. I don't think these initiatives are failing. I mean, these initiatives are not as big and as successful as they probably could be if they had more opportunities to work on these levels also. But I think quite a few of these initiatives at the moment are slowly moving forward because they can offer Delta, even though not all of these hardware stuff is being sorted out, they can offer some security on the software level. And that's why people who actually invest the time into investigating what is this option good for me compared to that option, and, and they see the Delta. But at the moment, of course, this is mainly business users and organizations who actually have time enough to compare two versions and people who have a very refined risk analysis. <coughs> so it will take quite some time once these things will arrive at the consumer market. There, w there are therefore governments who do the risk analysis. I mean, they're buying these kind of devices. There are therefore companies who are willing to invest into to whatever, I mean, businesses that we see here on the table and other ones. So it will come. The question is, will it come and fast enough and shouldn't it come faster? And from that point of view, of course, and advocating the idea of saying we have a limited set of functionality and we would like to actually have that also bought for the masses and in, an, in, a, in a way that is more easy to understand, that is better quality. That would be the game. But my, my point would be actually, and that I was advocating, I was asking from the free software movement, also from MUFO, of course, don't overload this thing with too much functionality because then you have too much complexity again. And once you have such a device, I could imagine, I think one should go into the race and see whether people wouldn't be willing to to actually use it and maybe to carry something extra. I mean, quite a few people are willing to carry some extra key for their house lock and on top of other keys. So I think for, uh, if the people understand that there's an advantage, then actually they may be willing to use it. And we have never put it to the market, so we don't really know. So I, I want to make also change topic a little bit and so also speak about security, yeah. security requirements. So is there not a problem of governance that cooler to tinker with things and develop things rather than making secure things to do code reviews in your free time or in your limited time you have. Or for example, there is a lot of proprietary software to check for security weaknesses. Does this also exist free software for this or should we invest more in free software to check for security? And is there a role for government to um, promote this? Well, certainly we'd like governments to help. Governments have done some of this and we'd like more. My take is that that money could be completely wasted if it's addressing, well, from the point of view of increasing trustworthiness, that type of freedom. If it's allocated to, uh, no, uh, to tools which are too complex to be verified. For example, the US government invests a ton of money on maintaining and expanding free software tools, widely used, Tor, for example, or many other systems, which are directly indirectly financed by US government. It may not be a coincidence that their c funding and the kind of extension and improvement to these tools are never nearly meaningful enough. So that, uh, in a way, it, uh, it, uh, it promotes all the, all the initiatives which are not aiming at meaningful level. Uh, and, uh, and actually, in a way, actually uh, taking away the, the ground for actual demand for meaningful kind of projects you know, aiming there. So I think that these funds should be uh, allocated very carefully, you know, to minimum. But I think meaningful is a dangerous term because it's meaningful means something else for everybody. Well, I, do, I define it in the, in the term because th that's why I took an effort that could look you know, kind of strange, but I tried to uh, get a definition of 15 lines as detailed as possible of what we could set as a term uh, meaningful. Okay. And meaningful, I'm, 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 I'm saying something that can resist a government investing 20 million, uh, tens of millions of euros trying to break the life cycle somewhere. Okay, uh, there are some other people who uh, wanted to respond to this. Um, my observation, I only have a very small visibility in, into what governments fund, but my observation is that um, they are the main sponsors currently of, of free software, um, be it through university research, be it through, <coughs> as in our case, um, uh, through uh, setting up requirements that favor free software for some, some types of use. Um, so they are already doing quite a bit to advance that uh, field. But they could also do much more, in my opinion. So for example, one thing that everyone seems to take as a given is that we have to depend on um, Microsoft Windows, for example. And we, we are not going to get rid of it ever. And I think that that's wrong. The investment to actually come up with an with a compelling operating system for the masses 
um, that could that would be able to compete with Microsoft Windows is not that huge. If Europe or uh, a nation state such as Germany uh, would be really, really willing to be independent and sovereign in that kind of technology, it is a reachable goal. And so far, no one has really, really been investing in that. We just take it as a given that we have to cope somehow with Microsoft um, um, sending back our data to their own data centers. And I don't know why that is. That could, uh, that could be more that is being done. Okay, I think it's getting time for concluding statements. And maybe just as a suggestion, this is also only about software, but what about free hardware? We discussed it briefly in the previous panel, but is this, I think if you want to have commercialization or separation of processes, this hardware can play a very big role there. I think just we go down, we go down the line, I don't know where we, st we start. Yeah. We start oh, okay. If I may just, I mean, okay, that's fine. respond to a request for <laughs> that's fine. a humble attempt at trying to summarize stuff. I guess um, looking back at the original question, um, there's agreement here that um, there are ways for the free software uh, movement to lend a very helpful role in arriving at systems, including hardware as well as software, that uh, allow computing under control of the user. And uh, I guess there are many different technological ways, attempts, uh, roads, pathways, etc., to reaching that goal. Um, one way is certainly just for the moment, since we focus on uh, security, privacy, uh, just look at parts of that, and just make sure that you can at least build a trustworthy base, and then from that on you can you can grow. And um, as long as you get the architecture right and make sure that there's that there come come back to the original statement uh, by Karl Rannenberg, as, as there's also an organizational. Um, framework that allows you to do that, and not just in a one-off matter, but just in a continuous process. Um, and if we then also realize that we all profit from that, great. If we want to make chips in a way that is uh, highly assurable, we've got to have free hardware designs to make. So developing free hardware designs for the kinds of chips that you need in uh, a device we'd want to have, that's an essential part of it. People are working on such projects. I don't, I'm not the person who knows all about them. Um, okay, in regards to, um, to hardware, same thing as for software. You need the extreme minimization to have uh, even the, the remote chance to have meaningful trustworthiness. And that's where the problem on most of the initiatives, they try to have one device, a mobile device that has this dual OS virtualization, a safe and uh, unsafe. They're usually sharing much of the same hardware uh, on the machine, which is highly complex, mostly not even verifiable, let alone uh, verified enough. A few of them, uh, the more high assurance, they're based on a, on a secure element and they built separate hardware components that root uh, until the user interface. But there's no public uh, uh, idea, so m uh, there are some solution, German solution that involved uh, BlackBerry and uh, Secu Smart and so on, or NXP. They seem to be leading to that direction in which they have uh, a, a, a smart card, which is very powerful with a lot of computing power where all the trusted elements are, and we are not sure what, uh, what are the checks on NXP and uh, to make sure, but let's assume that that is solved. And they have, uh, a control on the fabrication level that BlackBerry brings in and so on, all the way to the screen and so on. But we as a user are not no, uh, allowed to know enough to see if really the, 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 the whole track end to end of the trusted part is really you know, trustless or I'm um, trusting a bunch of people. And up until today, everything available, you're trusting a bunch of uh, elements that are not trustworthy. Okay. Mm, I think lots of has been said already about trusted hardware, but it doesn't stop at the hardware design or the VHDL files or something like that that make up the design of the processor. It's also the the actual manufacturing part that needs to be that would need to be trusted. And I see Europe as having only limited capacity there currently to uh, come up with its with its own value chain for building trusted hardware. Um, I know about these approaches of using a trusted element a small computer on, on a smart card, for example. 
but I think most of the approaches I've seen are in some way architecturally flawed and still depend on having to trust the, the main platform despite having a secure element. So I don't have a good solution. Pierre said it this morning already, and we don't seem to have a European chain where we can produce hardware in all processes and stages that we need to arrive maybe at the end of a smartphone or a computer. So that would be solely produced in Europe and that would, would maybe decide, okay, because it's Europe, we can trust it. Regardless of the problem, whether everything that is European, you may want to trust or not. But we don't simply don't have that in Europe, that is for sure. What probably is needed is to design such a chain, at least to see what would be needed, because we don't even have a proper chain design for that. Probably what will come out of the designing of this chain, and chain will be that there will be production elements that we will not be able to trust. And probably then when we and cannot trust the production or that, uh, that element of the production chain, at least we need to check better what is coming out of the production chain. So that means we need to improve on evaluating the product that comes out of an untrusted element of the production chain. And on that one, we probably need to improve. And I understand from many people that this is probably the only thing that Europe at the moment has a capacity because it, while it does not have the production capacity at this moment, at least it would have the analytic capacity. And that's why the, and why the evaluation of this stuff is important. And that's, of course, also in my advertisement from the afternoon panel. Okay, so we conclude the panel. Let's thank all panelists for a very interesting panel. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>